Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's morning when I'm recording this again. Glad my glasses. I'm sorry. Hello. Good morning. Let's start this over again. Coffee. Well, this mug. I have to show you my mug. I have this friend who likes to send me snarky mugs, and this, this you can see how old this is, how faded it is. This is a map of Georgia, and it says stupid, because I moved to Georgia at one point, and we called it Stupid Georgia, so there's my Stupid Georgia mug. So if you're wondering, that's what I'm drinking from. So, hi, good morning. My name is Meg. I am the blogger at homeschoolgameschool.com where we talk about enriching your child's education with games and hands-on activities. And I have a game for us to review today. And we're going to talk about field trip etiquette for homeschoolers. So, um, we'll get to that in a minute. A little chit-chat here first. Um, some updates. Don't really have a lot. Um, we have some group buy updates at homeschoolgroupbuys.com. We have... A discount for 50% off of a membership to an art lesson website so you can subscribe for a month three months or a year and you get 50% off and um, it's a type of membership website where um, your entire family can benefit from it for one membership cost and that's it's um art ventures sorry I'm kicking my table here hi April you're my only person this is too early in the morning isn't it um, I had a lot of trouble waking up this morning. Anyhow, the art website, artventures.com.au, it's Australian, and it's kind of like the YouTube for art. And um, we're going to get that discount up today. Uh, so anyhow, let's just jump into this. If you are watching this on YouTube or later on Facebook, um, this was originally a live recording, um, a live broadcast, so if anybody else jumps on, maybe they'll ask questions and you'll see me interacting with them as best I can. Um, if you're on YouTube, I realize that that's kind of a pain in the butt, just skip over it. So first, we want to talk about this awesome game. It is called Hungry Minds Study Game, and this is the Island Edition. So about... Two weeks ago, I got this unsolicited email from a guy named Kevin, and he has a startup game company, and he was a teacher in Canada, and he developed this game to um, help his students study, and the game is so neat because you can use it to study anything that you want to study. It's so cool. So let me show you it again. Hungry Minds study game island edition um you can find them they are online they do not have the west best website ever kevin we're gonna have to talk about that um they have for facebook i need the box open um the first thing that i noticed is that this is a very very high quality game which doesn't want to open um a lot of the startup games are of a lower quality and that's okay that's expected because if you're just starting up you don't have the Capital, hi, Lilani, mwah. You don't have the capital to, you know, get the best game pieces and whatnot. But this, this is great. This is a solid box. And then it comes with these pieces. Um, a lot of them fell out of the cardboard, but you punch them out anyhow. So the deal is that it's one board. Let me show you the one board. And on the one board, you play four different games. A lot of pieces, a lot of pieces. Okay. Just dropped one. Hold on a second. Not doing so well today, guys. Alright, so let me show you the board. This is a very large, high quality board. Okay. So, look at that. See, that's a pretty big board. You're going to need an entire table to play this or a large surface. All right. Let's fold it back up. Let me show you some details of this board, okay? So there are four, like I said, there are four games in one. One is jungle themed, one is ocean themed, one is safari themed. So 
the board kind of, there's the ocean. It has elements of all of that. And you start there, or you could turn it over this way. Um, but look at the artwork. It's cute, right? Kind of reminds me a little bit of Frogger. Can you see that? Alright, so that's the board game. It folds up easily. Alright, so I'll show you everything else it comes with. We haven't actually played this yet because I need to come up with the lesson cards that you have to make. Now, they do have some. I printed this one out online. On their website, they have, right now, I think three or five, I'm not sure, um, pre-done games. And then you print them out like this, and you cut them out. And it comes with this, this stuff. This is, I, I don't know what this is called. But, um... It's like that gummy stuff that you use to affix posters and such to the wall. It comes with a strip of that. So what you would do is, this is, like I said, this is one of the pre-made games. You would, you love my shirt, look, look see. Um, I got this at the Disney store on clearance. They had a clearance sale last weekend or the weekend before. They had two t-shirts for $20, I think. I got this and then I got a Minnie Mouse which is sparkly, which I don't do sparkles, but it was really cute. Um, and they'll be perfect. We're going to Disneyland in December for our Christmas present, so it'll be perfect for that. Um, I love Alice. I love the artwork of the traditional Alice. What? Yeah, we're going to Disneyland, or yeah, then we're on sale. Um, we don't have a Disney store really, really close. Tiki Tack. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm fighting a cold here. Yes. Tiki Tack. That is what it's called. Um, there's probably more names, but yes, that's what it is. It's like sticky play doh. So you print these out and cut them, or you make your own. And then, depending on what game you want to play, you have the cards, right? So there are four different games you can play on this, and each game has a card that explains the instructions. I cannot tell you how much I like the fact that each individual game has its own cards, its own sheet. It's not overwhelming, and if you're like me, I can read the directions, but they're not going to do me any good. I have to see it or really, really understand it. The fact that each game is on one sheet really, really makes it less overwhelming, and it's just one of those little things that they thought about that makes a big difference for the game. So we'll show you game number one because that's the easiest to play. Game number one is like a memory game and it is elephant themed. It's called Elephants Never Forget. Yeah, yeah, April. See, um, we played this other game last night. It's, it's over there. I'm not going to get up the show. Show it to you. It's called Tower. And um, it's another indie startup game and it has such potential, but it's overwhelming. There are like six different variations of the game and they kind of put it all into one book and the directions are intertwined. Like if you're playing game number one, do this. If you're playing game number two, do this. And then on the next step, it does it again. And it confuses me. And you know what? It was 10 o'clock last night. We still didn't know how to play it. And we, we gave up. It, it was just too difficult. Um, I keep asking their publishers to please do a walkthrough a playthrough of it, because that would really help, but we'll see. So anyhow, back to this. This is game number one, and it's like a match game. So this is the one where the ticky tacky tape comes in handy. You print out these, you cut them out, and then it tells you what cards to use. So for this one, you're going to use the question cards, which are these. And um, they're still in the wrap, because like I said, we didn't play this yet. So when you cut these out, you've got words and then planets. Like you have a, this is Neptune, and that's a picture of Neptune. So it's played like a memory game. You have to um, find the picture of Neptune and the word Neptune. And then you move along the board, right? So that's game number one. And that's really, that's the easiest one to play. Uh, then we have game number two which is Fly Snap. Okay, so this one, you use post-it notes, and you have, I can't, I can't even tell you how high quality these pieces are. And they each come in their little individual bags. 
So for this one, the example that they give is using, is learning your times tables. Can you see that? So what you do is you're going to put, this is a theme, so you're going to put three timetables on this. You write it on a post-it note, you stick it here. Um, I just ordered some post-it notes, so um, I had the dream. <coughs> Sorry, it's my asthma. I had a dream that I went to the store to buy post-it notes for this game. And I got there, and the back-to-school sales people had completely wiped out every single post-it note in the store. What a weird dream, isn't it? All right, so you have these, and you have the fly cards. I just put everything in this box real quickly. Oh, here they are. They're literally right in front of me. These are little fly cards. Not open yet, but there's a bunch of them. So, on the back of the fly card, you are going to write a times table. So, if if this, we put out a post-it note on here that says three times tables, then on one of these, we would put three times one. Next time, we would put three times two. So, you follow the directions, right? And you have these frog cards. Here they are. You've got these, right? And I know this is a lot and overwhelming, but I just wanted to briefly show you everything. All the directions are in here, so. So you have one of these, and you have this, and if you get it right, you put it on here, and, and you play a game, and it's a great way to, you collect, you collect the flies when you get the problem right. Then you get these wild cards that are in there every once in a while. And then whoever ends up with the most wins. It's a great way to practice your multiplication tables without your kids knowing that they're practicing their multiplication tables. I mean, yeah, kids are smart. They'll figure it out. Anyhow, put those all back. Game number three is Ocean Chase. And in this one, it's a fast-paced sink or swim game. Questions are written on sticky notes and placed on the game cards. The game cards are here somewhere. They look, there's really a lot of pieces here. The game cards look um, just like the other ones, but they're blue because this is an ocean-themed one. There we go. Got some cards here. Um, so you shuffle the cards and you place the water tiles. These are the water tiles. Where are the question cards? They're here somewhere. There's a lot of pieces in this game. All right, anyhow, so you put them down, and then you have a whale. I did see the whale. She's here somewhere. One of these days I'll be organized, guys. I just showed you the whale at the beginning. No, 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 no. Well, anyhow, there's a whale. And there's a game, and you um, use it to match up facts. For instance, on here it has, on the question card, it says, what's the largest planet? And then the answer would be, um, I don't know, what is the answer? Jupiter, maybe? Or you could use it to study foreign language. Like, on the question card, you should have, what is the French word for sugar? And then they would answer sucra. See, that's like the only French word that I remember from high school. So, great way to review review anything with the clever use of tic-tac and post-it notes and see oh my gosh the whale was literally right in front of me the entire time this is the whale and they eat the they eat the uh, answers I need some coffee it's gonna be a long day so um show you what everything that's in this game oh you also get for game number three which we I don't I don't know if we went over oh and here are the question cards I was looking for you get this cool little pouch oh you get three pouches oh look at that each game has a pouch so you can separate out all the pieces so you don't have a mess like this you have them all nice and this is this is really cool. What is that? Is that a brain? What is that? You ever see the um, articles about the sheep in, I don't know, wherever they are, Scotland or whatever, that get caught in caves 
and they come out like four years later and all their wool is like so um they have so much of it that they can't see and they need you <laughs> i think it's brain yeah see here's the logo it's the brain in the logo makes more sense that way all right anyhow so these are great. So you can save all of your pieces for each individual game, your cards and the die. And um, look, in one of them, you've got these cute little monkeys. Those aren't monkeys. These are monkeys. Okay. And fish. And they have the cards uh, gendered. There is, that's the female. And that's the male, which I know gendered things. But they have them on the same card, so whatever. Um, and they are, well, anyhow, uh, so you can put them all in there. So this is a really, really cool game that you can use to study, review anything you want. And it saves you from having to make your own game. Now I happen to enjoy making our own file folder games and our own review games, but once in a while, you know, you kind of end up doing the same thing all the time. And Sometimes kids are more receptive to something with the bright colors. You don't have to worry about, you know, running out of ink when you're making the game. You don't have to worry about artwork or anything like that. This is really, really cool. And it it's, I want to say right now, it's $39 for the whole thing, which I know seems like a lot. But really, in the, when, in the world of games, $39 is is pretty typical of a good game and a good game with um <coughs> I'm getting real wheezy of uh, with high quality pieces like this and with cutout pieces so when you get this game it is going to take you about 10 or 15 minutes to punch everything out to get everything organized but then once you have it down all you have to do is print out the um the cards that they already have there they have uh, right now they have Oh, all I can remember is the um, solar system. I don't remember the other ones, but they, they sent me an email with a couple of templates that they're adding. They're adding ones for fractions, decimals, place value, um, time. Time is another one. You could do the matching game. You could have a digital time. You could have a clock, an analog clock, and you could do that for the matching game, or you could just do the analog clock and um, <coughs> do that for the, uh, for the main questions. So I wanted to show you that. I'm going to show you one more time. Hungry Minds, let me get their website for you. I think it's just Hungry Minds. I have 15 websites up. Hungry Minds, study game, there we go. Hungry Minds, study games, with an S, dot com. And right now it is $39 free U.S. shipping. Uh, designed by educators, best practices aligned, review any lesson. Oh, and something else cool that they did is they sponsor a professional surfer from Puerto Rico and he is a teenager and they use some of their profits to sponsor him in his travels around the world and his athletic pursuits, which is pretty cool. So it says grades K through five. Um, I see no reason at all why you can't use this with older kids. Um, if you are studying um, chemistry, storage almost full. I'm going to keep getting these warnings and you're going to see me pause. I'm not saving anything. Um, happens every time I do this. I don't know. Uh, oh, yes. If you are studying chemistry, um, there's no reason why... You can't put the elements on these and do some kind of fun game. If you can think it, you can do it. You can also do, um, we have on our website an ancient Egypt game that we made ourselves. You could get the cards, um, the card file for that. It's at homeschoolgameschool.com. It's under printables. There's click printables at the top. You'll see the ancient Egypt trivia game. You could download that and then just print out the game cards. You could use those. And that way you just use the ticky tap. Ticky tape, that's fun to say, ticky tape. Put the uh, question on the blank cards. There you go. So there's that. HungryMindsStudyGames.com. I will have a review up. 
on or before September 14th, and I'm going to have um, a link for you all to go and buy it. It'll be an affiliate link, so if you click through that, I'll get a little kickback because I need coffee. Every penny helps. So HungryMindStudyGames.com. Okay, so now we're here going to talk about field trip etiquette. And I wrote a post about this a couple of weeks ago, and it's at HomeschoolGameSchool.com. And um, right under the logo, there's a search bar. And if you go to the search bar and put field trip, you'll find it. Or it's HomeschoolGameSchool.com slash HomeschoolFieldTripEtiquette. That's kind of long to type out. So... Let's talk about field trip etiquette. Um, when I when I wrote this post, it was from the perspective of somebody who is ooh, look at that attending a field trip. What to do before, during, and after the field trip to make it safe and fun and the least amount of drama as possible for you. Uh, someone said, "Hey." How about writing something from an organizer's perspective? So we're going to talk about that a little bit after this, after we talk about the attendees first. So field trips, I love field trips. I love taking my kids on field trips. I, I kind of like organizing them. Um, I've organized quite a few over the past 16 years, and um, there are a few truths that always, always happen. So first, you're going to have people who don't pay. You're going to have people who complain about the time. You're going to have people who don't show up. And then you're going to have the people who show up and cause trouble. And then hopefully you have the people who show up, do what they're supposed to do, and then leave without drama. And our goal is to make more of those people happen. So why, why are field trips a good idea? Well, I mean, they get the kids out, right? And they get to explore new and different things. And it gets you a financial discount. So, for example, the Crayola, the Crayola, um, it's not a factory. In Florida, in Orlando, there's a, a Crayola Experience. That's what it's called. Crayola Experience. And it's still relatively new, about two years old. And it costs like $20 a day to get in. But if you go as part of a group, it's 10 bucks, right? So you're saving a significant amount of money. When you have as many kids as I do, it, it's a big difference. So you could go with your friends and save some money. So there, there's so many reasons. And, and, you know, people complain about socialization and homeschoolers. Well, field trip is one of those ways to get them out in the world. And we're going to talk about socialization on another week. But it helps to get them out in the world so they see different things. They, they experience different things. Um, so there are, as somebody who attends a field trip, there are some etiquette rules um, that you, you need to go. And, you know, some people think that they're common sense, but I found over the past, you know, decade and a half that they're really not. A lot of people don't think about these things. So um, sometimes you need to call them out. So here I am. I'm calling them out. I don't mean any offense to anybody. I'm just calling them out because if you know better, you do better, right? So the first thing, before you go on your field trip, I want you to look into the field trip details really, really well. I want you to map it and see how far it is from your house. I want you to see if you are going to need toll money to get there. I want you to see if it's a three-hour drive and you have to be there at 10 a.m., are you really able to leave at 6.30 because you want to get there early? So map it. Find out how much gas money it's going to cost, how much toll money. Are you going to have to stop for food? Are you going to have to stop for bathroom breaks? Are you going to be able to build that time into your schedule? Is this too far for you realistically to get to? Okay, so that's very important. I can't tell you how many times I would schedule a field trip two or three hours away, but we had to be there at 10 a.m. And how many people didn't show up because that morning they're like, Meh, I want to sleep in, or I was up too late last night. For normal things, that's fine. But if for a field trip, that's not okay. Because sometimes, if you don't show up, the venue is going to give your spot away, or they won't welcome you back. So you need to make sure that it is within a distance you are comfortable going, 
and that the gas money and the toll money and possibly food money are not going to strain your budget so much to the point that you might not be able to go. So you want to ask, map it, and then ask any questions first before you RSVP. Some good questions to ask. Um, is this place stroller friendly or am I going to have to carry my young child? Do I have to pay for children under the age of three or whatever is uh, normal in your area to pay for children? Do I have to pay for adults? Um, is this place appropriate for my child with special needs? If you have a child with sensory processing disorder, some field trips are worse than others. Is, is this going to affect that? Uh, another one, food allergies. If you go to a food factory, like a dairy farm, are your food allergies going to be affected just by being in this place? Um, we took a tour of a dairy plant once, and in this dairy plant, they made, um, they bottled milk, they made sour cream, yogurt, and ice cream. Um, but because they made ice cream, they use nut products, um, including peanuts. And if you go anywhere where they are processing peanut products, even if you don't eat the peanut or touch anything, the dust can still be in the air. You can still react. You need to know this information if you are allergic to peanuts before you get there because nobody wants you to die on the field trip. That would ruin everybody's day. So ask questions like that first. Next, you want to RSVP according to the directions of the organizer. Now, the organizer may collect RSVPs via email. They may do it via Facebook. Facebook's real popular. They may do it via some other kind of e-invitation website on the Internet. Whatever they say to do, do it. They're going to tell you how to do it. Usually it comes out in an email or a Facebook post. Just follow the directions. Just read them. If you have questions, ask. Um, that way, the organizer doesn't miss you or miss your numbers, because if you have RSVPs coming in on Facebook and via email, it could get really confusing to merge them all into one or to track um, exactly who replied when, especially if you have a large group like we do and field trips fill up really quickly. Um, you know, I like using... Google Documents because there's a timestamp. So anytime anybody fills out, I make a Google form, name, number, any liability waiver, um, PayPal name, all that. And then when they fill it out and hit enter, it timestamps them. So if somebody says, hey, I responded before so-and-so, you can take them back and say, no, you didn't. So-and-so responded at 7 a.m. You responded at 9 a.m. It happens. It really does. I don't know why. I don't know. So RSVP according to the organizer's instructions. Don't, don't try to do anything, you know, slippery. Just do what they say. Now, you want to pay on time using the method that the organizer prefers. PayPal is very, very popular uh, for these sorts of things. I strongly recommend using goods and services. I've seen a lot of people recently who are using the friends and family option, collecting a large amount of money, and then having their PayPal account flagged and flagged for improper use. Because if you're collecting field trip fees from people who really aren't your friends and family, because, you know, that's meant for, like, bill payments and allowances and, you know, sending money to your kid at college, that sort of thing. Um, if PayPal will shut your account down, they will assess you fees and fines if you use the friends and family is one the wrong way. So I strongly suggest goods and services. Technically, you are not allowed via PayPal um, rules to add a fee onto the field trip fee to cover the PayPal payment fees, which is, for me, it's 3% plus 30 cents. Um, I have a business account. It might be different for other people. Um, but you need to reflect that in the cost of your field trip. Okay, so if admission is $10 and... PayPal takes 60 cents, you might want to charge $11 or $10.60 or whatever for the field trip. So, um, you're going to pay using the method preferred. Most people use PayPal. Um, if you do not use PayPal, if you are adamantly opposed to using PayPal, and some people are, and that's cool, I mean, it's your money, protect it, um, talk to the organizer about other things they will accept. Um, they might accept cash from you or a check. 
that's mailed, but know that if you mail a check, it's not exactly secure. Um, you know, checks are very easy to steal. Um, Amazon gift card funding is another one that I've used in the past for small amounts. I mean, I can't afford to pay for a $700 field trip out of pocket and then end up with $700 Amazon credit. That doesn't help me. Um, but for like, you know, one or two people who have like $5 or whatever, Amazon, Amazon credit is another good one. A prepaid Visa card might work. So just talk to the organizer, see what they prefer. And if they are not willing to work with you, if they will only accept PayPal, there's probably a reason. And the reason for me is that I pay for field trips using my PayPal debit card. So if everybody gives me the PayPal, I have the money in there, it's all good. I could call the venue, use my debit card for, from PayPal, and it's fine. If they want to pay me through a check, I have to cash the check, wait for it to clear, transfer it into PayPal, and the whole process takes 10 days or more if it's on a weekend. Sometimes I don't have that time. So talk to your organizer, do what they prefer. If you can't work anything out, don't get upset. Just think, you know, oh, I guess it's not gonna work out. Um, another great tip is, this is kind of a little wishy-washy, but if you have kids who fall in love with the idea of a certain activity, you might wanna hold off on telling them about the event until you're 100% positive you could go. Me, my kids aren't like that. So I could say, hey, who wants to go to the pumpkin patch? And they raise their hand. I'm like, all right, cool. We're, we're good for five. So if that's a concern, you know, think about that. Do know that in most cases, your fee is non-refundable. Here's the thing. We know people get sick. We know that animals get sick. We know that things come up. We know that cars break down. But if you don't show up for the field trip, the venue is still going to charge for you. So we still have to pay for you. Um, so we can't give you your money back if we still have to use it. Now my group, the policy is to, um, if somebody can't go and we have enough notice, we will help that person find somebody to take their spots. So if you've reserved three spots for a tour, you can't go and we have a couple days notice, we can usually find three people to fill that, um, to fill the spots. And then it's up to you to collect the money from them or decide if you want to donate the spots. So you don't get any money, but they're still used. That's up to you. Um, if you cancel out the day of, or if we can't find anybody to take your spots, we still have to pay for you. So we're not going to give you the money back because if we give you the money back, then it's coming out of our pocket. And if somebody has to pay out of their pocket for field trips, they're not going to schedule any more field trips. So you need to be extra cautious that you know that you can go um, with, you know, with reasonable doubt. And, and if somebody does get sick or does wake up with a fever or whatever, um, see if there's a waiting list and try to sell those tickets. If not, be understanding and know that nobody nobody expected this and there's nothing that they can do and bummer, you just lost out on your money in the tour. It's really, in the grand scheme of things, it's a small problem. And I know sometimes field trips are expensive, but that's just how it is. So, the next one, before the trip. Do not complain about the location. If it's too far for you, Keep on scrolling the cost because field trip organizers do not set the cost. That is strictly the venue. Um, we have a play, a place where people go to plays, and the tickets are often $30 or $45, and they don't allow children under three in the theater. Well, yeah, that upsets people that the tickets are still expensive. They're still half off, and that they don't allow young children, but that's, those are the theater rules. Those are not the homeschool group rules. So there's nothing we can do about that. So don't complain about the location, the cost, the age is allowed, the day of the week that it's scheduled, the time of the day that it's scheduled. Sometimes organizers can control the day of the week or the time within, you know, limits. Sometimes we can pick between an 11 a.m. tour and a 2 a.m. tour. Um, usually we can't, but sometimes we can. So the perk of being an organizer is that you can schedule things according to your schedule. And that's a perk of being an organizer. You cannot accommodate everybody. There's no way that, you know, all 60 people 
are going to be able to be accommodated. So if, if it doesn't work, maybe if the time or date doesn't work for you, maybe wait a few weeks, let the trip be done, and then schedule your own trip. If you have a big enough group, you can do that. Just wait until the original trip is done to schedule the second trip. That, that's just courtesy um, because you don't want – it's confusing. If you have two trips to the same place on different days, it, it confuses people. It really does. And um, you can even name them different things like Thursday tour and Friday tour, and people will get them confused. They'll forget which one they paid for. They'll show up at the wrong one. Um, not to mention it's just bad practice to schedule a trip somewhere – if somebody else is already doing it. It's just rude. So wait until the trip is over and then go from there. And that it also gives you the perk that if anything went wrong on the first trip, um, if anything went wrong, then there you go. By the way, I'm not getting notifications again. So if you are joining, welcome. I can't see that you're joining. I see my number go up and down. I'm not seeing comments. I'm seeing nothing. So anyhow, if you just joined us, I'm Meg. I'm from homeschoolgameschool.com. And we are talking about field trip etiquette. So we just went over what to do before the field trip. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in. If I see them, I'll answer them. If I don't see them, which is looking like what's happening, I will get online and look through all the comments after this is posted, and I will answer them that way. So... The night before the trip, here are some good details. Now, you're not going to have to do all of these, uh, depending some trips, you know, if they're in your backyard, whatever, or if they're at an outdoor event. But some of these, especially for longer trips, you're going to want to think about. First, plan out your route and set your alarm. You want to set your alarm early because you want to arrive early because you want to accommodate for traffic. Um, Living in Central Florida for so long, and now we live around Portland, traffic is a big deal. So a field trip to the zoo, the zoo's 15 miles down the road, but it could take me an hour to get there, depending on traffic. So know your route. Um, in fact, sometimes the day before the trip, about the same time of day that I'm going to be driving, I map it just to see what the current drive time is. Um, GPS is very, very, very good for that. I use either Waze, W-A-Z-E, or uh, Google Maps. I prefer Google Maps, but um, I will use Waze if traffic is real bad. So you want to map it out. You want to plan to leave 15 to 20 minutes early. That will give you time to stop for coffee if you need to. Coffee. Or to pull over for a bathroom break. Or to accommodate for a long line at a toll booth or bad traffic. So sometimes if you get behind an accident, though, what are you going to do? If you're behind an accident and traffic is stopped, and that has happened. In fact, it happened to you, April, didn't it? When we went to Legoland, um, there's a bad accident on one of the toll roads, and four or five families were late, uh, like by over an hour. There was nothing we could do, but I was able to talk to Legoland and tell them, hey, we've got these families who are stuck behind an accident. So Legoland was really cool. They worked with us, and they told us what gate to go in. Uh, for the latecomers, and they would take them off, and they were really cool with it. So if that happens, um, contact the organizer. The organizer will, should, give you their phone number so you could call or text them. Now, they're probably not going to be able to answer their call or text you back because either they're driving or they're in the middle of a field trip, but let them know. That way they could try to organize or try to um, accommodate for your late arrival, if they can. And things like theaters, if you're late, then usually they make you wait until a um, intermission to be seated. All right, so pack everything you need. Put it in a basket by the front door. Put it in your trunk. Whatever you have to do so you don't forget it. So think about what you're going to need. Are you going to need sunscreen? Are you going to need extra clothing, which, you know, really is always a good idea? Um, rain boots. What about lunch or snacks? Do you want to pack those? Do you want to take water bottles? Uh, get them up. Get them in the car. Um, think about every possibility. If the field trip is outdoors, think about rain, snow, mud, and prepare. Prepare for the worst and expect the best, right? Um, other things that you can do. Think about what you're going to have. Hello, Erica. I'm talking about field trips, which I think, I think, I actually met you on some of those before, didn't I? Before we both moved. Um, 
where were you? Oh, think about what other things you're going to need in the, in the morning. Are you going to need breakfast? If it's an early morning trip, maybe set cereal out or oatmeal packets out or power bars or whatever you want for breakfast. Um, have it ready to go. My kids are not big breakfast eaters, so sometimes I have to pack lunch and breakfast and then we'll get in the car and we'll go and then we'll hand out breakfast. Morning, little buddy. Garrett. <laughs> Garrett's up. He's usually the one who's behind me causing trouble. He just woke up. You should probably get dressed if you're going to be on camera, though, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. So think about what you're going to have for breakfast and have it out. What clothes you're going to wear that day. Um, if you need any equipment for the day, if you need pens and pencils, magnifying glasses, whatever, get them out, put them by the front door, do what you have to do so you can pick it up, get out the door, buckle up the kids, and get going on time. So, check the weather again before you leave, and go to bed early if you can. Maybe you could try. <laughs> it's my tip, at least for the kids. Uh, what you do not want to do the day of a field trip is decide that you want to stay home. Decide that you haven't had enough sleep. Decide that it's cold outside. I don't want to go. Don't do that. Now, things happen. Like if you've got a baby and the baby was up all night and not sleeping, we don't want you driving. We don't want you risking your life or the life of other people just to get to a field trip. It's just a field trip. So text the organizer. Tell them what's up. See if there's a wait list of anybody who can go. Don't, don't jeopardize your family's safety to get to a field trip, okay? Now, the day of the trip, wear appropriate and comfortable clothing. Um, let's talk about appropriate clothing. What I feel, outfits that I feel are appropriate and outfits that you feel are appropriate may be different. That's totally cool. But there are some places where certain attire is more appropriate than, than others. So the theater, we have several theaters that our group goes to. Um, the community theaters are really low key and shorts are fine. If it's a daytime, a matinee production, shorts and t-shirts are fine. If it's an evening production, um, shorts and t-shirts are sometimes okay. Jeans are usually preferred, t-shirts are okay. And if it's a special performance, often, you know, maybe khakis and a polo shirt. Um, the other theater is a professional theater. And there's a little bit of a difference between the professional theater with touring productions and the community theater. So for the professional theater, um, you're going to want to wear, I guess, what would be considered business casual. Um, same with symphony. You dress up a little bit more for the symphony, even if it's a local symphony. Um, other things. If you are going on a nature walk, I know it gets hot in Florida and, you know, everywhere, or, but you want to wear pants. Maybe shorts if the trail is well maintained. If you don't know if the, tra the trail is well maintained, you want to wear pants because, you know, there are thorns and sand and dirt. You want to protect yourself. Um, if you are going to a water park, which are High Angela, which are, you know, popular field trip uh, destinations in Central Florida, even, even here in Portland, there are water parks. You want to go to the water park's website and see what their dress code is. Some do not allow two-piece bathing suits. Some do not allow shirts over the men's trunks. Um, a lot of it's for safety reasons, so you want to check that check that out. Um, and, you know, just, you want to ask questions about appropriate attire. And, you know, if nothing is, is said about specific attire and you're okay with your kids' outfits, then go for it. All right. Leave on time. Allow for potty breaks. We already talked about that. Oh, remind your children of applicable safety rules and behavior rules. There we go with that error again. Remind your children of the rules um, before you leave or on your way. And how do I approach this delicately? If there is something that they're not used to seeing that's going to be there, such as say somebody is going to be in your group who has a child in a wheelchair, maybe hi Annie, maybe 
just mention it ahead of time. Oh, hey, so-and-so has a kid that's in a wheelchair. Um, don't walk in front of the wheelchair, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. Meet your party at the designated meeting spot, ready to go. That means be there on time, meet at the meeting spot, get a few minutes early, so get there a few minutes early so you know where it is, and have everything you need to go. If you need your a backpack with supplies, have it ready. Don't leave it in the car, have it, have it ready. Um, let the organizer know if you're going to be late. One thing you do not want to do is call the venue for any reason ever. Let the organizer handle it. If you're going to be late, don't call the venue, call the organizer. If you have a problem with something that happens during the field trip, don't call the venue, call the organizer. We had an incident once where we had scheduled a boat tour of the city of Winter Park, Florida. They have this cool little scenic boat. And I don't remember the exact issue that somebody had. Um, maybe they decided they couldn't go there, but they called the venue. And the venue got very upset. I, I don't know why. Um, I guess whoever they talked to didn't know about the trip. And the venue actually canceled our trip because this person called and said, we can't make it. So they must have, now it's coming back to me now, they must have thought that the entire tour couldn't make it. So we got there for the tour and they said, we canceled your tour. And so, you know, here 40 of us like, what are you talking about? Because somebody called the venue to say they couldn't make it. So don't do that. Now, if you have a problem with content of the tour, for instance, when my oldest child was about six, she's 20 now, but when she was about six, we toured the Orange County uh, Courthouse. And it was part of the, it's not the new courthouse, it's the old courthouse, and it's part of the tour of the History Center. Well, there happened to be a very high profile serial killer trial there and it was it was Ted Bundy and we didn't realize that the tour of the history center was going to take us to the old courthouse and they have the courtroom where Ted Bundy was convicted and sentenced kind of sealed off well they took us inside and in the corner of the desk he had scratched his name and they have it covered in plastic so people can see it and not destroy it they had the chair that he sat in and so we're there I had no idea I didn't know I was I had only been in Florida for about I don't know I guess it was six years at that point and I had no idea and so we took this group of kids and my six-year-old was one of the oldest ones and the tour guide starts talking about Ted Bundy and what he did and how he traveled to Florida and why he was convicted. And the kids are like, especially my daughter was very sensitive. So that was a problem. So instead of everybody complaining to the venue, we talked about it. And I, I, I took that on as the organizer. I, I addressed the situation. I told them, you know, these kids are young. We, we would have really appreciated a heads up about being educated about Ted Bundy. They gave us information we didn't really think our kids needed to have at, you know, the ages of four and six. So don't call the venue. Always deal with the organizer. Okay. During the trip. Okay. These, these rules are maybe the most important. Oh, my nose is... Do you want to come talk to them while I go blow my nose? That's okay. Keep your blanket around you. Okay. He, Garrett's going to talk to you for a minute while I go blow my nose. I don't know if I'm coming down with something. I'm feeling like, a, I swear I'm sick for every one of these. I feel a raw throat. My, my lungs feel wheezy. All right, here, Garrett, come talk to them. Over here. I just got to go blow my nose. Uh, I don't know what to do. Say hi. Hi. Uh, during the trip. During the trip. Do keep talking between adults to a minimum. Yep. Thank uh, you. Storage almost full. Yeah, I know. I keep getting that. It's not saving on my phone, though, so I don't know. Thank you, buddy. Say bye. You want to go make me some coffee? No. Put him to work. Okay, so during the trip, keep 
talking between parents and children to a minimum. You can't hear what's going on on the trip if you're talking to somebody else. Angela says hi. Do you remember going to the park with Angela? She's got two sons. She came to our house before, before we moved. Yeah. She went to the park with us several times. Yeah. Um, well, she says hi. So keep talking to a minimum. Um, there's nothing worse than going to a field trip and having the parents talking behind you. It's okay to be social. Oh my goodness, we want you to be social outside of the field trip. Uh, we went on a field trip of a grocery store and these two parents the entire time were talking and they were getting loud. It was very distracting. Uh, the kids can't pay attention if you're talking. So keep the talking to a minimum, socialize outside after the trip, before the trip, go get lunch afterwards, whatever. Just don't talk during the trip. And that goes for kids too. The kids, you can, you know, give them a little smack in the head. Don't smack your kids. I'm just, I'm just teasing. Don't smack your kids. Just, hey, use your ears. I mean, if they can control the public school groups, surely we could control our own kids, right? <laughs> um, if you have a child who is acting out in the trip or causing a distraction, remove them. Um, I happen to have a three-year-old who we call Screamy McScreamy Pants because she screams. I know, real original name, right? Um, we have to remove her, which means sometimes I need to find a friend to say, hey, can you keep an eye on my kids? Fortunately, my other kids are older. Now my nose is itchy. My other kids are older, so they can... You know, my old, my second oldest just turned 18. So if he goes on a field trip, he's cool. He got the other kids. It's all good. I don't have to worry about them. Um, I have had to take Garrett out a few times when he was younger for running around the art museum, that sort of thing. It is better to remove your child or your entire group from the party than to let them be a distraction. Um, and then maybe if that happens, reconsider the next field trip. Um, remember that your child may not be ready for the art museum at three. The art museum will still be there when they are four, five, or six. And if it's not, there's more. So, um, like me, I have, right now I have five children that I'm homeschooling. They're between three and 18. Well, the 18-year-old technically, I guess, is done. But um, he still tags along with us a lot. If you have a large age range, have a backup, maybe a friend there, or um, bring a babysitter with you. So if you have to take one or two of them out, your kids can still enjoy the trip and they don't have to sacrifice that um, if a little one fusses. Okay, so ch -ch 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 -ch, remind, we remove your child if they become distracted. We just got that. Uh, do keep a close eye on your child. Remember, you are there for your child's education, not for you to socialize. Like I said, we want you to socialize, just do it later. But if you're socializing, you can't keep an eye on your kid and you, you don't want to lose your child. You don't want your child to run off. You don't want your child to destroy something or touch something they shouldn't. Because um, if that happens, you may not be invited back to the venue. It could happen. All right. Okay, here's another one that's really, really important. Do say hello to newcomers. Don't do it during the trip. A wave would be all right or a thumbs up or whatever. Um, if you see somebody who is on the outskirts, even if you just go stand by them, that means a lot to them. So about, it, it was a little over a year ago, um, I took my three youngest children. The baby was two at the time or almost two and then Garrett would have been oh, not quite eight and then Liam would have been I guess ten and we went to a field trip and it was I think it's called Water Ventures and it's where the springs have oh, I get a text message it's where the springs have this big I think it's Zephyr Hills the water company has this giant uh, bus and the bus has been retrofitted on the inside to have all these neat science activities to teach you about Florida Springs and They drive the bus around well you can pay money and have the bus come to your location And then they give you a class and the class is about an hour long and some of its inside some of its outside It is really cool if you ever get to see if you ever see the water venture bus stop and, and go look at it. Um, they park them at 
some community events. They have them at um, homeschool conventions, or you could schedule it to come to you. So we went to this, and my friend had invited us with a, a group that we were not part of. And we went, and we talked to my friend, and it was great. But my friend was busy dealing with the trip and making sure everybody followed the rules and showed up and paying and whatnot. So she was busy. And I literally stood there for an hour and a half, and then if you include the picnic time and the play time afterwards, two and a half hours, not one person said hello to me. Um, I, I kind of said, hey, smiled at some people. Mostly they largely ignored me. They already knew each other, and they had their little groups, and they knew who they were, and they made it quite clear that newcomers were not welcome, no matter what. Look, we homeschool. We're already on the outskirts of the population, you know? Oh, I don't even know what that means. I got a reminder on my phone and I don't know what the words mean. So we're going to be reminded of that later. So um, we're, we're already on the outside and I'm a secular homeschooler. So that puts me even further on the outside. Say hello. It, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt. You don't have to be best friends with these people. Just say, hey, nice to see you or hey, having a good time or even... Hey, you know, like Garrett's doing, wave, whatever. Oh, Sit with somebody. Bad. I mean, it's like, it's like high school again. Like I don't bad. have time for that. So what I took away from that experience is that I am glad. Yeah, Brandy, have you ever have you ever had that happen where people just ignored you at a trip or something? I mean, it was a it was not a good feeling. It was not a good feeling. So what I took away from that is I don't want to ever, ever, ever do anything else with that group ever again. And I didn't. I just didn't because I'm not going back into that. And it wasn't just me. It was my boys, too. Now, I had the two of them, so they were able to kind of um, keep company with each other. But the kids, they were just as bad, you know? What are you talking oh, Brandy, about? I'm sorry. We should do a whole post on that and saying hello to people and etiquette. So do you remember the Water Ventures field trip with the big bus that we yeah. went to? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. What about it? How nobody said hello to us and we were the outsiders. And then we went to the playground afterwards to have lunch. Nobody sat with us. We were there first because I had wheeled the baby over because she was kind of fussing. Nobody sat with us. They all sat at different tables. Whatever. All right. Um, so after the trip, we've gone through what to do before the trip. And if you weren't here for that, you can, uh, when this video goes live, you can go back to the front. I'm going to get it on YouTube eventually. Uh, the YouTube channel is Homeschool Game School. Or you could go to homeschoolgameschool.com and search for the field trip article. Um, the search bar is right up top, and you'll find this, these tips there. So after the trip, uh, first, you want to consider visiting the gift shop or making a small donation if appropriate. Um, if the field trip was free or very low cost, such as a tour of the backstage of a community theater, or the tour of a mattress factory, or we did one of a grist mill. The tours were completely free. The tours were completely free. Consider giving a donation. Uh, a couple of bucks is fine. A buck or two. Whatever you have a cash um, or a Taking check or whatever. Taking your coffee. Don't drink my coffee. It's all gone. Yes, adults could use. Oh. Yes. And, you know, often I wonder if parents keep their kids at home to avoid socialization. <laughs> I don't think most do. I think some do. Um, I don't think most do. So uh, consider leaving some kind of uh, donation if you can. If not, not a big deal. Um, do send a thank you letter. Um, normally the organizer handles this. If the organizer doesn't ask everybody to sign a a card, then maybe you can do it. If you don't want to do that, that's cool. Go to their Facebook page, leave a positive review, uh, send them an email that they can use as a referral to somebody. Do something to show the venue. Careful, you're shaking the table, baby. I'm going to make the tripod fall. Do something to show the venue that you are thankful that they opened up their business for homeschoolers for a field trip. Um, do something. So, you know, card, donation, Facebook review, whatever. All right, uh, do leave on time and be considerate of opening up parking spaces for other paying customers. This isn't always gonna be a thing. You know, some places have plenty of parking, but if parking is at a premium, um, 
try to be mindful of leaving on time to open up those parking spaces for somebody else. Um, we often do field trips um, around 10 or 11, so we can do a picnic lunch afterwards. We will map a park that's nearby, and then we'll all gather at the park afterwards. That way, you know, the kids have been good for the field trip. They get out to the park. They can go crazy on the playground. Everybody can eat. The parents can socialize. It's a fun time for everybody. So do say thank you or leave a comment. Do thank the organizer. Sally, thank you so much for organizing this. We had such a good time. If you could do it at the venue, great. If not, send them an email, send them a text, whatever. Thank them. Um, let them know that you appreciate the time because organizing a field trip takes a lot of time. Uh, and they're not going to do it again if they don't think people are getting anything out of it. So thank them. Let them know that you appreciate it. Look, someone else is doing the work for you. Say thank you, right? Oh. So, all right. And the last one, which I've already touched on, do not publicly blast the venue if there is a problem. If there's a problem, no matter how serious it is, don't go to Facebook, don't go to email, don't go to Yelp, don't, don't do anything until you talk to the organizer. Um, and the reason is maybe you see a problem, but there really wasn't a problem. Or maybe somebody else doesn't see it as a problem. Talk to the organizer to figure out what you should do. The organizer may say, you know what? Yeah, that really is a problem. Maybe you should contact them. Or the organizer may say, oh, I know. Let me talk to them and see what can happen. Um, go to the organizer first. Always deal with the venue as an ultimate, very last resort. Okay. Now, let's talk about, that's what you should do, all that, the last hour, is everything you should do if you attend a field trip. So let's talk about a few things for organizers, a few tips for people who organize field trips. Organizing a field trip is a lot of work. You have to have a lot of time uh, to do it. Some are easier than others. Um, some, you know, some field trips can accommodate an unlimited number of students, and they're free. All you have to do is get out the word to show up. But some, some uh, are not, most are not that easy. You not, need to have an exact number. You need to turn over money. You need to um, confirm your numbers ahead of time. So email is your friend. That way you have a written chain of all communication. Usually you don't need it. There are instances where you may. Um, another thing you want to figure out is if you're accepting fees, if you're accepting fees and you get free chaperones, you need to determine how what you're going to do with those chaperones. Yes, you can go play if you want. What do you have? Is that the Xbox controller? <laughs> you can go play. Yay. He wakes up earlier than everybody, even earlier than the three-year-old, and so that's kind of his Minecraft time. Go ahead. You can play Minecraft. Bye, have fun. So, um, that it's kind of his quiet time and helps him get ready for the day. And he plays Minecraft, which I don't mind. Um, it's on the Xbox and it's kind of, you know, it's quiet music. It keeps him relaxed. It's fine. So, um, if you are paying and you get free chaperones, you have to decide what you're going to do with that money. I have seen some people who keep that money for themselves. So, like, um, trying to think of an incident incidents um legoland i don't know what the current field trip rates are um we haven't been there for a while but back in the day it was ten dollars for students i think it's 12 now and then 25 for adult but for every 15 students you got a free chaperone well how are you going to to do that i mean who gets the free chaperones so you have to decide what you're gonna do with that um some of the options are you know keep the money for yourself i have seen some groups do that to turn a profit seems kind of um I don't know, fishy to me, but I don't know what else you're supposed to do. Um, I guess you could, when you get the final reservation, final number of people, you could split the free chaperone up per person. So if you have four adults and you get one free chaperone, take that $25 discount, divide it by four, and then each adult gets that. That's kind of hard unless you really, really trust the people that you're splitting the discount between um, because there are people who will not pay for your field trip. Um, they give you lots of excuses, but there are people. So that's another thing to consider. Um, or another thing you could do is collect the full fee from everybody and divide it up when the people get there. 
that gets complicated. Or what we often do is our homeschool group has a love fund and we use it to put money in GoFundMes for families who have cancer or for families who need help paying for field trips. Um, we have a policy where once a year, anybody who needs help paying for a field trip can apply for the love funds and then we'll give them what we can. Sometimes it's enough to pay for a full trip. Sometimes it's enough for a discount. And everybody has one, uh, can apply once every 365 years for that. And then, like I said, we use it for um, family members who have cancer. We had several recently, and we, you know, help them out whenever we need. So that's another option um, if you're comfortable keeping that money. Whatever you decide to do, decide ahead of time. Work it out in your brain and then go with that. Um, so collecting money, I prefer PayPal. I do add the fee onto it because if I have a field trip of 100 people and it's a 60 cents fee for each, that, that adds up to 60 bucks, right? And I don't want to have to pay that out of pocket just so we can go on a trip. So I do add that in. Um, I never, ever, ever collect for friends and family for field trips. Um, I've just known too many people who have had their PayPal accounts uh, flagged and shut down and had to pay fees and fines because of that. I just won't do it. Um, plus, you have some buyer's protection if you send it as goods and services. So what else? Let's see what else we have here. I'm going to go down the same list and talk about organizer perspectives. So before the trip, um, spell everything out. Whether you advertise on email or Facebook, spell it out. Um, Ask the same questions that people who are attending would ask. Is it stroller friendly? Is it wheelchair friendly? What are the allergens like? Um, does this tour happen in all sorts of weather? Do we have to wear special clothing? What about special shoes? That sort of thing. Um, if there's any question, ask before you put the field trip out. Um, you can ask if people are interested in this trip. For instance, you could say, hey, I'm thinking about scheduling a field trip to the fire station. Is anybody interested? This is a double-edged sword because, you know, a lot of people will say yes, even if they have no intention of it. Um, it will keep you busy with notifications, especially if you're on field trip. And then you always get the people say, yes, if it's at a date and time, I can go. Yes, if it's at a date and time, I can go. You don't need 700 people telling you that. So, I mean, if you want to ask if people are are interested first cool i suggest texting your friends hey are you interested in a field trip to such and such especially if it's a field trip like a fire station where you may only be allowed to take 12 kids in um you don't want to advertise that as a potential field trip to a group of 300 people if you can only take 12 kids in so you might want to wait until the trip is scheduled ask those what did you hear that that's my cat what are you doing come here you want to come up here you want to show everybody Pretty kitty. I have a mean cat. She's mean. She doesn't scratch, but she bites. All right. Bye. She's old. And she's cranky. She likes everybody but me. Probably because I tell strangers on the internet that she's a mean cat and she bites. All right. She was down here playing with the one of the baby's toys. Anyhow, so ask questions. Um be very very clear on certain terms age limit um, accessibility and the cost okay and what you get for the cost um, and then spell it all out say um, I like to use a simple format um, I am not terse I use a lot of words all the time I write a book somebody emails me says hey what time's the field trip I will write them back three chapters so use the who, what, when, where, why, how, whatever. That helps because I'll put who, you, where, and then the location. Um, always encourage people to map it first to make sure they can go before they RSVP to you. And then you have to collect RSVPs. Um, you can do this via email. Facebook is kind of a good idea if you have a small group. We have a large group. There is, I think, 1,300 people now. Um, and when your group gets that big on Facebook, you can't advertise events to everybody um, easily. So what I like to do is put out a post, and we have a Yahoo group as well, so I put a post on both with a Google form. And it's really easy. If you go to drive.google.com, I mean, everybody has a, a Google account, right? <coughs> it's your Gmail account. If you don't have one, get one. And you can 
open up a form and make a form. You can ask for every piece of information you need. Um, you're going to need names. You're, you want a phone number because um, like if you have a field trip, an outdoor field trip that's canceled last minute because of rain, you need to let these people know. So, and you can't always rely on email for that because some people don't check their email in the morning. Um, before cell phones, we always told people, check your email the morning of. So if you don't want to use the phone or whatever, um, warn people to do that. So you want name, you want phone number, you want their email address, you want their PayPal name and email address because often people will have another family member pay for their field trip or they might have a business name on their PayPal. But um, you might be looking at, a $50 payment for a field trip from Buffy's Soaps and Candles. You have no idea who Buffy is, when really Buffy could be Sally No Name from the group, right? So you want to collect their, put in a little uh, space to get their PayPal name and email address if they use a different one than their normal name and email address. Um, put um, a liability waiver on there. I don't know if it's legally enforced. I don't know. But anything that you need... Like, I recognize that my fee will not be refunded if I don't show up. They could click yes or no. Google Forms is very, very versatile. You can Anything you need, you can put on there. And then it's a, a link. They click a link, and they fill out the information, and then the information goes to a spreadsheet for you. So you get all of their information in a timestamp. So if the field trip is limited to so many people and it's a first-come, first-served thing, you have proof of that. So let's talk about people who don't show up. It happens. People will not show up. Um, it's kind of a joke between me and my husband. Um, hey, 25 people are repeat for today's field trip. 12 showed up. We actually, at one point in time, had a show up rate that was about 50% for paid field trips and around 30% for free field trips. Sometimes that can be a waste waste of time, waste of money. And then people get upset. Um, we had one field trip we toured the backstage of a community theater. And the theater was not close to town. It was about 45 minutes away. It's where my kids went. So I drove there every day. So it was no big deal for me. But for some people, that's an unreasonable amount of time to drive. They didn't map it. Didn't know it was that far. Um, and then they got there. We did the backstage tour. It was a free tour. It's a small community theater. There's not a big backstage. So we went through the office. We went through the costume rooms. We went through the sewing room, uh, the changing rooms. We even took a walk on the catwalk where they do the sound and the lighting. And it was really cool. It didn't take real long, but it was really cool. And people were upset. And a lot of people didn't show up. It was almost not worth our time. So that's a big problem. So how do you combat that? Well, you can be very clear that fees are not refundable. Um, but if it's a free field trip or a cheap field trip, what are you going to do? Well, our group set up the option for an organizer to charge a premium. So it's between 3 and $10 per person or family, whatever you want to do, um, extra. So we will charge... $10 a family for this tour, even though it's free. If you show up, I will hand you your check back, or I will log into my phone after the trip, get to PayPal, click refund. Um, we refund your money if you show up. It does take time, especially if it's a large group. Um, you, you're, you could refund it when you get home. If you do not show up, that money is given as a donation to the venue. So if we had five families at $10 a piece who didn't show up for the tour, there's 50 bucks that I have in cash or if it's PayPal that I just transfer to the venue. And there you go. Um, that is something that a lot of groups I've noticed are doing more and more for free and cheap field trips just to get people to attend. And when we did that, our show up rate went to about 70%. If people have money on the line, they are much more likely to show up. Um, another thing you can do is start a invitation only subgroup for field trips and only invite people who show up. Um, people can get offended with that, so keep it secret. And then if you do that, your attendance rate's like 90 to 100%. And that's something else you can consider if you have a small group. Um, something else that you can consider to get people to actually show up. Let me think. 
I mean, get creative. Um, but people are not. There will be people who don't show up, and there will be people who ask for refunds. So be very clear up front that money is not refundable unless you are able to refund it. Um, our, we, ours is just non-refundable, period, no matter what. It's at our discretion if we want to refund it. Some venues will not will charge us for whoever shows up that day as long as we meet our minimum number. Um, if we meet that minimum number, then they don't charge us for the extra, whatever, you can refund the money. Um, sometimes, like, if a kid ends up in the hospital because they're so sick, the last thing a parent needs to worry about is losing money from a field trip. So if it is feasible, I will refund the money, but I, I can't always. And if I have to, like for the field trips that take a flat fee, I can't do that. Cat, stop it. Now she's going to throw a pen at her. Cat. <laughs> she's clawing on the woodwork. I did. The pen didn't even come close. Cat was over here. The pen was over here. Um, but it scared her enough to get her to stop. We buy. The only thing this cat will claw on or play with are those um, the cardboard scratchers. That's it. And I had like eight of them around the house. So she wouldn't claw on her new furniture or the woodwork. And the baby would just, the baby started breaking them apart and shredding them. There was cardboard everywhere. And then apparently the baby took a piece of cardboard and put it in her pocket. And then I washed her clothes. I never check her pockets because she's a baby. I mean, she doesn't put things. She can barely get her hands in her pockets. And there was cardboard everywhere in the laundry. It was all over the, the washing machine. I had to, like, vacuum the washing machine. It was a mess. It was a mess. Anyhow, um, so people who won't pay, um, just give them the details. Be upfront about it. And if you have somebody who's upset, just take it with grace. Maybe they're having a bad day. If they're abusive to you in their email, don't reply. I mean, maybe you have to remove them from the group or whatever. Now, if you see a pattern with somebody, and, you know, I have a couple people coming to mind who always RSVP. They always take those spots, and then they continually don't show up, or they continually back out. There's one or two people that I've been trying to meet for months because they're RSVP to everything, but then they never show up. Um, it is okay to remove those people from the RSVP list. It's okay. Um, tell them why. They may not like it, but it's okay. They can't deny that it's not the truth. Um, just make sure you have your facts, okay? Generally, hands-off is best, but um, some people, you can't do hands-off. You just, you just can't. Um, you don't want your field trip being canceled because people don't show up. I, I um, did a field trip once. It was to the same history center I mentioned earlier, the Ted Bundy thing. Um, it was the same history center, and it was probably about two years later. And I wanted to do a tour of their new exhibit. And I organized a customized tour with them that wouldn't go through the Ted Bundy courthouse, or at least not mention Ted Bundy. And we would spend extra time at this one activity, hands-on activity for the kids to do. And uh, a, a large, a, a lot of people RSVP, probably about 30 kids. And I got there, and I'm waiting, and waiting. Slowly people start to trickle in. By the time the tour started, um, and it was free admission, so the tour and everything was completely free. By the time the, the tour started, we had maybe five people, five kids total, uh, three of which were mine. So um, the History Center canceled our tour right there. They said, we scheduled two docents to be here with you and to do these activities for all these kids. And you guys didn't show up. You could tour the place on your own. You could pay the admission fee. We're not accommodating you. Well, that was like a shot in the gut. Um, you can't, people will just not show up. And that bugs me. And we have been turned away from venues for that before. So do everything in your power to avoid that by giving them the information. Charging a premium fee if you have to, even if it means you refund it. Um, do by invitation only with people that you know will show up. 
whatever you have to do to make sure they show up, right? Um, and there have also been times when I have uh, helped people with gas money. We kept the love fund that I mentioned earlier, um, that we have extra, the chaperone fees or whatever go into the love fund. Um, I've paid for people's gas money to get there. Um, sometimes out of pocket. If I can do that, great. I can't always um, do that. But, you know, whatever it takes and whatever you are comfortable with. So we got that. Uh, the night before, send out, or even two nights before is even better. This is not two. This is two. Um, I'm out of coffee. Send out an email or a text reminder, whatever you do, a Facebook post reminding people of where to go, when to show up, what they have to do in the morning. Um, clothes they have to wear. Something else you can ask if you're like going on a tour of a uh, nature reserve or something, ask about clothing. Normally they'll tell you, the venue will tell you. Um, you want to keep a positive relationship with the venue. You want to give them their phone number, keep a paper trail. Turn that down. Um, and uh, keep a positive relationship with the venue. That way if something happens or if you want to do the trip again, you can. Um, always follow up with the venue before the trip. Um with a finalized number and if there are any special accommodations like if lunch is provided and somebody has an allergy um, they need to know about that and uh, you need to know if they can accommodate that or if the person needs to bring their food whatever um, other things for organizing field trips a thank you note go to the Dollar Tree and um, at Dollar Tree cards are two for a dollar sometimes you can get a whole stack of thank you cards for a dollar like eight of them so go pick up some thank you cards I got like the little the little ones like this they come in a pack of eight or twelve for a dollar um, at the event have the kids sign it if you forget or whatever it's no big deal just um, get the card when you get home sign the names of the family like the grooms family the Smith family the Doe family and send it as a thank you um, if you collected extra funds for donation this is a good place to put them in if you weren't able to donate them at the event, thank them for their time, write a nice note about your tour guide, whatever, do a thank you note um, for every single field trip. Even if the field trip costs $100 per person, send a thank you note. Um, I mean, you might not want to for every play that you go to if you have a re relationship with the theater, but maybe once a year. Um, we want to do that. So um, that's about what I can think of to make organizing easier. Google Forms, PayPal, thank you card, good contact, good contact. You don't want any um, he said, she said afterwards. Um, leave the drama out of it. There are people you don't like. There are people who won't like you. Doesn't mean they can't go to a field trip, that sort of thing. So that's about it for me. I'm going to have some more coffee. I'm going to get started on my day. My kid's school started this week. Let me see. Is there a way to go without making arrangements without... So way to go without making arrangements without being rude. My two kids and I have life-threatening complex medical issues and can never plan ahead for something like this. Is there a type of place you suggest for having drop-ins for schooling? Um, I'm a little confused about what you're asking. Um, you have complex medical issues. So you're going to have to uh, determine if a field trip is safe for you. So let me think of a recent field trip that we did. We did a tour of a grist mill. And the grist mill grinds up flour. Morning, honey. Liam's up now. Grinds up flour and corn. Um, there were some accessibility issues because it is a grist mill from the 1800s. So um, they tried to make it as wheelchair friendly as they could. And it wasn't too bad. Um, but there were accessibility issues. There are food allergy issues. So... Um, if that's not something you can do, then you're not going to go. Now, as for planning ahead, field trips do require a lot of planning. Some more than others. Like for Legoland, we had to plan months ahead because their field trips fill up so fast. We had to plan ahead. Um, if it's something that you can just go and show up for, like... Um, you know, a, a nature walk somewhere, if you're able to walk through the nature, then, I mean, you can determine if that's okay for you. Um, but field trips do take a lot of time and effort. So maybe you can make a list of things that you're comfortable with, um, like maybe an art museum. Um, 
where it's inside and air conditioned. There's usually no food, um, often one story. Maybe you could make a list of things that are good for you and then look for those field trips or organize one. If you are completely unable to organize or plan ahead at all, then maybe doing solo field trips is what's right for you. Um, or maybe get some friends who can do solo field trips with you. We can just never plan ahead and say, yes, we will be there. We are in a homeschool group who does a lot of field trips. But, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I have sympathy for you. I do. I understand that. Um, but it, field trips require a definite guess because almost all of the time, the venue needs an exact number, exactly how many people are going to show up that day. Now, you can email the organizer and say, hey, here's what's going on. If you have any backouts, will you let me know? And then maybe that morning, if somebody texts them and say, hey, my kid's sick, I can't make it, they can call you and say, hey, are you able to come to this trip at this time today or tomorrow? Um, get on the wait list. Um, maybe, like I said, do the solo field trips, plan things for just you and your family. Um, the, the field trips, I mean, I'm, I'll say it again, they do require a lot of time and organization. And Please stop. Over there, please. That's loud. The And that's not the organizer's fault. I mean, it's all up to the venue. When you organize a field trip, it's all the venue. And they want to know numbers. They want to know how much money to expect. They want to know how many people they have to bring in to work that day to accommodate your group. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. It's like, I mean, think of it like a school field trip. Um, they have to organize that. They have to have the number of chaperones. And a lot of it is for legal reasons as well, um, or fire code reasons even. So it's really hard to just drop into a field trip. I don't, I don't know of any um, drop-in things. I don't know where you are or what your group is like. But if I were you, I would become the wait list person. Let the organizer know that you'll be first on the wait list and then if they have somebody or a spot open up that day to let you know, and then you can tell them if you can reasonably make it that day or not. Um, that's what I would suggest. It does make, I understand, it does make going to field trips harder, which can make homeschooling harder, and it can be isolating. Maybe we could talk about the isolation of homeschool in another broadcast, or maybe I can do it in a post, um, because it is a real problem, um, it, it's a real problem. I understand that. <coughs> so, um, I mean, that's what I would suggest. Um, it may not be ideal, but I know that's about, that's what I would suggest. I'm so. cutting out a baby pig. Liam is cutting out a baby pig. All right. I am going to go. If you have any more questions or anything that wasn't addressed here, type it in the comments below. I will come back several times today and this week to go ahead and answer them. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube, sorry about the conversation. Um, you know, that's how it is. This was a Facebook live broadcast. So where can you find me? My name is Meg. I am at homeschoolgameschool.com. And if you go there, the search bar is right under the main logo. Go in there, type field trip, and you will see a post with all of these tips for field trip etiquette. And eventually you will find a review of the game that I mentioned earlier, Hungry Minds Study Game. It is a customizable board game with all the pieces that you can use to study and review any content ever, whatever you want. Sky's the limit. Um, that review will be up sometime before September 14th, 2016. Um, you can also find me at homeschoolgroupbuys.com. We've got some great group buys going on right now. We have tales2go.com, which is an unlimited audiobook streaming service for kids, normally $100 a year, but through the deal, you can get it for $10, bucks, $10 instead of $100. Um, what else do we have going on? Oh, Canoe Computers. It is a computer that your child will build and code themselves, and then they'll have a computer. Look, there's a baby warty pig on me. They're so cute. There's a baby warty pig at the zoo, and he's like this big, and he's like the cutest thing ever. Um, so the kids, the canoe computer, K-A-N-O dot me. Um, there is a code, a way to sign up for a code on the website, and then I'll send you the code, which I have to do today, and the code will get you a discount. A great, great computer gift, or um, computer gifts. Great uh, Christmas gifts. I'm putting one up there later today for Art Ventures, artventures.com.au. 
and it is a 50% off membership and the discount is lifetime so if you decide to renew the membership you'll get another 50 percent off you can sign up for a free trial at artventures.com.au use the code hs group buys 2016 hs group buys 2016 you'll get 50 percent off of that and i think a year membership is 79 dollars so you'll get a year membership to this art website where they give you art tutorials and videos um all year long for 40 bucks. Come on. I paid more than that for some art DVDs for my kids. And now I'm like, I really should have just gotten art ventures. So we have that. Um, what else do we have going on? We have a few bits box left. It is a book, a coding book where your child learns to code apps. Um, we have, last I checked, I think we had 12 left. We might have 10 left now. So that's homeschoolgroupbuys.com. Click on open buys to see what is available now. You can cl click on closed things, closed buys to see what we recently closed so you get a good idea of what we have. All right. Homeschoolgamesool.com, homeschoolgroupbuys.com. I am Meg. I will see you later. Bye.